So let me start with thanking the organizers for inviting me. It's a great honor to give this talk. And actually, it's not a talk, it's an oration. Uh, my understanding is that the oration is to be a bit formal. I'm not sure how I'll swing that. But it also needs to be given by somebody who tends to forget what they're talking about and moments incomprehensibly. I don't let you down on that. <laughs> Just to start with the usual declaration of interest, I have no links with any cigarette manufacturers, which may be important to say because my talk is coming to come, come up strongly in favor of the cigarettes. So I'll be talking about three things, about my Russell nicotine and public health, and then because I could talk about anything I please, because that was a very vague uh, brief I received out, entertaining with some musings on why harm reduction is controversial at all. And I think it's a weak part of the talk, it's just some thoughts, and that I would appreciate them later on your input, why you think that such an opposition to all this. And then, very briefly, I'll consider the question of whether alternative nicotine delivery systems are likely to increase or decrease use of cigarettes. So, let me start talking a little bit about Mike. Uh, Michael Hamilton Russell died in 2009 after suffering from Alzheimer's disease for a number of years. He died in, uh, in South Africa. His productive years were spent at the Institute of Psychiatry Addiction Research Unit, where he was a leading researcher in the field. I'm not saying one of the leading researchers, he really was the leading researcher. Uh, he left behind an enormous legacy, uh, and I'll take you through some, some of these things. And he may one day be counted not just between the giants of the smoking research field, but among the giants of public health research. Uh, he started on a note which Carl mentioned, looking at why people actually smoke. And nowadays it seems so patently obvious and trivial. Of course people smoke because there's a drug in it. Why else would you burn some leaves and inhale the fumes if there was nothing in it? But actually it was considered to be a psychological issue in the habit and as early as 1960s, Mike conducted a series of elegant and interesting experiments showing that nicotine drives smoking behavior. And if you give people nicotine through some other route, they will smoke less. If you start to take nicotine slowly away from smoking, they will smoke more to compensate. And to do that type of work, he has to have some kind of markers of nicotine delivery to humans, and this Colin Fire happened. He developed a coating in assays. He demonstrated compensatory smoking, which was again very important to show that what the tobacco industry was marketing at the time as low yield cigarettes actually did not reduce uh, harm, uh, harm and, and exposure to toxins. And it was a, an extremely important bit of work, laying the ground for all future uh, tobacco and nicotine research. I have a few pictures of Mike only, so I'll intersperse this talking about him with some of the pictures I have. Uh, here's one of them. This is very early after I, uh, after I joined this team. This was a conference in New York. In those days, we could have a weld smoking conference in a telephone box because there were so few people back in the field. But remarkably enough, these were, with the exception of myself, of course, these were the main uh, luminaries of the time, so we put Mike Russell there on the left, Martin Raw, then you've got Carl Fagestrom, and what's remarkable is, <laughs> is that over 75 years the guy didn't change at all. <laughs> <laughs> Which is just uh, remarkable. And then there's Saul Schiffman, who's still active in the field, one of the best brains we have in, in our field. Now, from that finding that people smoke for nicotine, there was a totally logical next step, and Mike was very logical, and his research trajectory follows a very clear and logical path. So if people smoke for nicotine, how about giving them nicotine through some other route, which doesn't kill them, and which helps them actually stop smoking and switch to another way of nicotine delivery? 
and he was instrumental in initiating uh, nicotine replacement treatments. The first liver replacement treatment, as you all probably know, was uh, was invented by Ove Ferno in Sweden, but Mai collaborated with Ferno in the first studies, proof of principle studies, later on the actual clinical trials, and his work led to the licensing of nicotine chewing gum. And then Mike was looking for ways of delivering nicotine faster because nicotine chewing gum wasn't all that effective. And he found from studies of people who put uh, tobacco up their nose and sniff it that that way you get faster nicotine hit than from oral tobacco. And that led to the development of nicotine nasal spray, which indeed is faster and more effective than the other nicotine replacement drugs. But it's rather unpleasant. And only smokers who can tolerate it get used to it and they benefit from it. And then he also was involved in the first study of nicotine inhalator. And I was involved in that as well as, as, as in his spray studies. It was already during my time at the unit. Uh, that particular uh, device then gave rise to the Pharmacia nicotine inhalator, which doesn't really get nicotine into your lungs. And so it didn't progress beyond where the other NRT products, the replacement products, were at the time. Now, while, while I'm talking history, this is the unit, a rather rundown, the Porta Cabin, which was the addiction research unit at the Institute of Psychiatry, Mons Hospital in London. And there were two teams working there, the alcohol researchers and smoking researchers. And you can see Mike Russell standing in the middle. Next to him is Martin Travis. In the last decade of his activities, actually more than a decade, Mike was then focusing on helping smokers quit. Uh, his paper on <coughs> brief advice by family physicians was, and I think still is, the most widely cited paper in smokeology in the literature on smoking uh, and smoking cessation. And he also developed a model for clinics to treat highly dependent smokers and the template for stop smoking services, which is now actually uh, active in the UK and a number of other countries. So all these developments actually owe to my, and there are many other things which I didn't mention here. This is after Mike's retirement. There was a, an event to honor him organized in Paris. And I put that picture there because you see some other people who started their career with Mike. I didn't mention before. So here's Martin Jarvis, who was there before Martin Rock. But this is Anne McNeil, who now actually holds the chair which Mike used to hold at King's. And this is Robert West, who some of you may know as well as a leading researcher in the field. And so Mike left behind two types of legacy. Uh, he was extremely influential in actually kick-starting the whole smoking research. But he also left behind a number of people who then carry on doing this type of research. And he wasn't, as Carl already mentioned, he, he wasn't your cuddly, nurturing teacher. Uh, he just was an example. He was a very bright guy who did hard no science. He asked questions and he looked for answers. And it was very different from the type of research I was doing at the time I joined his unit. I'm a psychologist. I did things which were much more glamorous much less useful. Uh, and now you know you see what real science could be. And it was inspirational and that's the reason why so many of his pupils stayed in the field and carry on trying to do something. I think it's also is the sole reason why why the UK is a bit ahead of the rest of the pack in liver take on nicotine in the quality of tobacco research. Uh, the US is quite a bit behind and very cautious, over cautious and not quite focused. And it's all still the legacy of my theory. So let's look at some of Mike's quotes. Now, years ago, there was an event in the UK where Martin Jarvis and myself were giving talks about Mike, different contexts, different parts of his work. We were joking that Mike Russell was a Nostradamus of smoking research. And if you can find in his writings a sentence or a paragraph which suddenly looks into the future and predicts with uncanny accuracy what's going to happen. And I'll show you some of other quotes from him in a minute. 
Now, this one was particularly important, and this is a quote you probably all heard. You may not be aware that it's coming from Michael Russell. People smoke for nicotine, but die from tar. And this is a tremendously important statement because it implies not only the reason why people smoke, but there's a bit in smoking which you actually could do without, it, and that is the dangerous bit. And it implies that nicotine itself is not all that dangerous. And notice where it was published. This is 1976, long before I came on, uh, joined Mike's team. And it was about low tar, medium nicotine cigarettes. And already in those days, very early days, Mike was thinking about developing cigarettes at that time, because there were no nickel replacement yet, where you would be gradually removing the toxins but keeping the nicotine. And there was a discussion which was going on until 1990s with American colleagues who were of the opposite uh, opinion. They wanted to phase out nicotine and keep the rest in. Now, it's not a stupid idea. There is a good rationale for it. And this is still sort of a pipe dream, a long-term plan in America of having cigarettes with less nicotine so that they become less addictive. People will stop using it because it's not doing anything for them. And that's how you will resolve the issue. Uh, of course, there's such a thing as alternative provisions of your cigarettes. Uh, and it may not work. It may work. But there was a direct opposition there. There was Mike saying, let's give people nicotine and just get rid of the toxins. And then there was the American guys. And in America, drugs have got a different connotation than in Europe, particularly in the UK. And removing drugs is very desirable and important and moral uh, mission. And this sort of sounds much more credible there than giving people drugs without punishment. There's something wrong in letting people enjoy themselves with no health consequences uh, at all. So, important quote here, and the bit about nicotine being fairly harmless is the key to it all. The whole discussion we are having about harm reduction hangs on the assumption that nicotine itself is relatively harmless. Mike actually was cautious about that. He was assuming that there may be a degree of cardiovascular risk with nicotine. He was still, of course, saying that this is negligible compared to the risk of smoking. And it's now being questioned. And a few weeks ago, uh, Stanton Glantz uh, had a thing on his university pages, which said, actually quoted Mike Russell, quite a big quote from one of his Nostradamus moments, and saying, Russell was a great scientist, and he's not disputing his contributions, but we moved on since he wrote this. We learned in the meantime that actually nicotine is harmful. And the implication is that nicotine is as harmful as the rest of smoke. And then you look at what is this based on, and I won't take you through all these details. Konstantinos did an excellent, where is Konstantinos? Is he here somewhere? He did an excellent job on this. And you can read what Konstantinos wrote about it. This is just waffle. This is totally unrelated to anything real. There are references to things which have nothing to do with nicotine or so nicotine. So if we are on the same page on this, and actually I wanted to say that since Mike wrote these things, we learned more about nicotine, and we learned more about it being actually safer than Mike thought. And we have data from lung health study where people were on nicotine replacement treatment there for, uh, for five years and then for 11 years, and there was no health risk. And we have extensive data on snooze users, where again, long term use of nicotine, <coughs> there is little health risk. I'm not saying that nicotine is 100% safe, but the comparator is not nothing but smoking. Now, I already mentioned nicotine in pregnancy, or I may not. You wouldn't be giving nicotine to pregnant women. There are other groups, clearly described groups of people, rather rare, little groups like people who suffer from various disease where nicotine would be harmful for them. So it's not that nicotine is overall absolutely safe for everybody, but you have to compare it not with nothing but with smoking. And then there's this issue I wanted to mention here. I normally don't mention this, and I'll tell you why. But nicotine has got some positive effects. And 
some of these positive effects may be actually quite major positive effects. Why don't we talk about this now? In the context of smoking, a message like that could actually undermine tobacco control. It could make smokers decide not to quit, and these benefits are negligible compared to risks of smoking. But when we talk about nicotine use alone, without the toxins, then these things do need to be taken into account. And the nicotine, of course, lowers your birth weight. People who stop smoking, uh, a proportion of people who stop smoking are much more likely then to develop diabetes. Uh, nicotine may prevent Parkinson's disease, or rather, I think one can say that it does prevent Parkinson's disease, ulcerative colitis. It may prevent some types of dementia. I wouldn't claim that the evidence is very clear and that it's nicotine or absence in smoking. But there are certainly potentially benefits, which you again have to balance against the potential risk. Nothing in life is totally black and white. You will always have a bit of that and a bit of that together. And so here are a couple of quotes from Mike on harm reduction. And this is written in 1991, long before these <coughs> words came on. And he's saying it's not so much the efficacy of the new nicotine delivery since temporary to cessation, but their potential as alternatives to tobacco that makes virtual elimination of tobacco a realistic future target. Now he was talking about the end game then, right? The end game became a fashionable phrase used in the tobacco control activism over the past couple of years. Uh, and what they talk about is mostly plain packaging and bigger health warnings. While Mike here was talking about the real deal, about just getting rid of smoking because people switch to something safer. And this was quite a big leap because there was no commercial uh, version of ego replacement. There was just uh, medicinal ego replacement. <coughs> and he's saying these products should be actively promoted on the open market to compete with tobacco products. And he could be giving this talk here today, right? Uh, how, long, how long after he's written this? You know, 20 years later. This is now becoming current after all these years. And they will need health authority endorsement, tax advantages, and support from anti-smoking movement if tobacco is to be gradually phased out altogether. And his advice has not been followed so far. And I have to say, I hope I'm not putting some black mark on Mike's legacy and memory if I say that he, wasn't, he didn't really have a very high opinion of tobacco control activists. And as he would expect, most activists do oppose safe nickel delivery products. But amazingly, there's also a strong opposition from bodies which are responsible for public health. And so I want to talk a little bit about why is there a controversy at all. At the face level, this seems to be a no-brainer. If smokers switch to a harmless form of nicotine delivery, it will have a massive revolutionary impact positive impact on public health. And you know, it would be a cause for celebration. It would be, I was looking for a slide to show you know, victory and celebration. And because of this is the time of the year, I came up with this. You know, this should be the, the emotional tone around electronic cigarettes from people who say that their aim in life is to help smokers not to die from something like this. And in reality, we were the controls. Tobacco control activists and medical organizations focus on risks and dangers. Research findings are interpreted to justify the negative stance. And goalposts are moving. It started with, well, nicotine is dangerous, isn't it? No, it isn't. All right, then there's something else is dangerous there, isn't there? No, there isn't. OK, well, it's luring children to smoking. No, it doesn't. Oh, well, it's renormalizing smoking. No, it doesn't. Oh, well, it rehabilitates the tobacco industry. Whatever it is, it needs to be stamped out and get rid of. <laughs> now, I was looking for a slide which would illustrate a disappointment. And I found one, and I showed it at one previous talk, so some of you may have already seen it. I didn't replace it because I think you can't really get a better uh, representation of disappointment than this. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a bitter disappointment there. And I want to. If I do have time still. You still do. You have 20 minutes, so you have 10 more. Thank you. So I can 
mull over some possible reasons for this. And here are some takes I have on this. And you may have different ones, and I would love to talk to you about if you if you have some other explanations for this. So the first simple one is the importance of the first impressions. In psychology, they are important. They are not easy to get rid of. And the first gut reaction to e-cigarettes was negative, particularly from tobacco control activists. Because there's the word cigarette, there's smoke, there's nicotine, which is addictive, shadows of tobacco industry. Something's make, somebody's making money out of this, out of the misery of people who become hooked. And so the first reaction is, this is bad. Then you get information, and the brain takes over from the gut, and you can actually process information and think it, think it through. But the first impressions, they linger. And you're selectively looking for justification. I was right all along. I always knew there's something wrong with it. And that may lead to sort of selective take of the very sound bites you hear. And you tend to disregard the positive ones and more listen more close to the negative. Another possible tentative uh, reason is the influence of pharmaceutical industry. They were actually very alarmed by e-cigarettes. They still are. They are losing uh, quite a big amount of money because the sales of all small cessation products are plummeting and e-cigarettes are taking over. And how do I know that they influence opinions? Whenever I hear an uh, official organization saying that e-cigarettes need to be licensed as medicines to ensure a level playing field, then clearly they are talking pharmaceutical industry. Because the product is not competing with, uh, it is competing with some medications, but it's not its primary purpose. It's competing with cigarettes. And if you see it only in that context, then you know where that, that type of bias is coming from. And indeed, the British Medical Association, that was the main argument for medicalization of e-cigarettes to ensure level playing field with nuclear replacement products. And the European Union, early on, had the same type of pronouncements. I wrote to them, other people wrote to them, that the comparator is smoking, not medications. And I think they now use that argument less. And I think that was one of the <coughs> early influences on uh, regulatory <coughs> opinions. The next one are the zealots. In tobacco control, on the fringes, you've got people who think that drug use is evil, nicotine is evil, they want to eradicate it, and e-cigarettes are now standing in their way, and this is madness, this is my pictorial <laughs> representation of that, uh, but you've got that. This is on the fringes, but this is also an undercurrent on some of the tobacco control activism. There is something fundamentally wrong with people taking a drug which has got any rewarding effects. And then, this is the last one I can come up with. Activists generally feel that electronic cigarettes threaten their achievements. And some of the most vocal activists seem to see their main purpose not in preventing this disease, but in fighting tobacco industry. And they may even be aware of the e-cigarette promise. They may even acknowledge that it could save millions of lives. But they still think it's worth it to sacrifice that so that tobacco industry doesn't achieve what they call seat at the table or new respectability. And it may sound far-fetched and mad, <coughs> but here's a quote. And this is last year, a British Medical Journal ran two articles but the e-cigarettes should be as freely available as normal cigarettes or not. And Jean-Francois Etter wrote a very nice article saying, of course they should be available at least as free as cigarettes. And Simon Chapman wrote uh, an article saying, no, no, they should be, you know, is, uh, normal cigarettes need to be available more freely than electronic cigarettes. And this is a quote from there. The needs of smokers must not become the tail that wags the dog of tobacco control policy. <laughs> So the tobacco control policy is not there to help people not to die and to avoid smoke-related problems. It has got some other much higher and much more important purpose. And I think we're talking possibly, this is my hypothesis, which may be totally wrong, 
but I think this is more of a gender. And it wouldn't surprise me too much, because public health issues are often driven by moral agenda rather than by evidence. And you see it in the discussions of abortion, assisted dying, which is a big thing in the UK at the moment, sexual behavior, of course, all drug harm reduction issues, uh, they meet with very strong moral arguments. And moral beliefs are emotional and unshakable. And people who hold these beliefs do not need evidence. The evidence is self-evident. It's revealed. It's emotional. It's there. They do need evidence to create converts. So you've got a mission. You want people to share your beliefs. And you're using evidence for that. And you can cheat because the end justifies the means. You can twist the evidence. You can do anything with it because you're saving souls. You've got a higher purpose behind it. So that's one possible uh, take on this. I think calling up evidence is, is our best and perhaps the only defense. I'm not saying that we have lots of evidence, that we know everything. I'm pretty sure that some problems are going to emerge. We are going to find some health risks of e-cigarette use. We may find that the next generation of the devices bring up new generation of nicotine <coughs> users. All those things can happen. But the problems which are presented so far to justify regulatory restrictions were just made up. We don't have any evidence of these negative effects so far. Uh, and I have the key question, prohibitions is probably too strong a word, I should put it there, but to people who want to overregulate e cigarettes, I would say common sense, many precedents clearly suggest that safer products replace the unsafe ones. Clive Bates in the morning was using an example of helmet for motorcyclists. You know, people who have safer ski bindings wouldn't be then lured to use the unsafe ski bindings again. The precedents go on sense, you've got a safer product, you're going to use that and you abandon the more dangerous product. And I have the question, every time anybody raises this, are you saying that if you allow e-cigarettes on the market, that it will somehow increase the use of conventional cigarettes? And that's the only thing which matters. All the other sound bites are irrelevant. So if people say, no, no, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that it's a renormalizing smoking. And you say, what does that mean? If it doesn't mean that cigarette use goes up, then it's not being renormalized. Or they say, I'm not saying that it reduces smoking, but it undermines tobacco control. Well, that has no meaning if cigarette use does not go up. Or it's rehabilitating tobacco industry. That would be of concern, again, only if cigarette use went up. So I think the number one research priority to me is to see what increase in e-cigarette use does to cigarette consumption and smoking prevalence. And that's, that's probably the only thing which matters to me. And so the last couple of slides uh, would be on risks and benefits of liberal regulation and restrictive regulation. And this is a very quick take on this. Clive Bates covered it much better this morning. But if you allow liberal, you need some regulation. You need to reassure uh, users that the product is as safe as it could be. But if you allow the product to continue to develop, some risks may emerge, some benefits will emerge. But you will see what they are, and you can balance them, and you can base your regulation on what you're actually getting. And you don't stop preemptively potential benefits, which can be absolutely enormous. And so this scenario, to me, would lead to this. But if you go for overregulation and you either ban uh, e-cigarettes or there's compulsory medicinal regulation, or you cripple them by regulation which is stricter than for cigarettes, as the European regulation is going to be, you will avoid some potential risks. But you will also preempt any potential benefits, and you will maintain the market monopoly of conventional cigarettes. And that's a disappointing scenario. Mm -hmm. And I think we are on the cusp of things. I know that there are people in the audience who believe that the die was cast, decisions were made, all we can do is just to try to make the best out of the very bad situation. I'm more optimistic. I think there are people in the audience who are fighting the beast, 
who are writing letters, making presentations, trying to change it. There's still a year and a half to go. And I still hope that it would go at least somewhere in the middle and not totally in the wrong way. And so I think I leave you with this question and this feeling that we are on the cusp of things and this is up to us which way it's going to go. Thank you for your attention.